welcome independent researchers, skeptics, and all of humankind, the shadow citizen. Shadow citizen will explore the shadows of an alternate reality. Your host, Rachel L. McIntosh. Right, everyone, thank you for joining us. I am so excited about our Shadow Citizen show today. I'm Rachel L. McIntosh. I'm your host. And that scream you just heard at the end of our song, that was me last weekend as I was watching TV. I was really confused what was going on in Boston last weekend. And, you know, I, I, I kind of just was watching it online mostly. And I felt for the people who were marching. I was like, you know what? There is some crazy stuff going on. I mean, on news, you see like stuff about the the KKK and the Nazis, especially the weekend before. There was Charlottesville, which was horrible. And then they had this big march in Boston. And all these people were coming out to really just, you know, protest against hate speech. And amazingly, they were protesting a rally that had been planned months in advance was for free speech. And... That's what they kind of rallied around because, and I thought there was uh, maybe neo-Nazis there going to be talking or whatever. And I said, well, maybe it makes sense that people are protesting. But then I saw online some of the speeches that were actually happening at the little rally. I said, wait a minute. I think, I think the media is kind of blowing this all out of proportion and it's getting people really riled up. And it got me really scared because there was over 45,000 people there really mad, getting ready to do some mean things. I wasn't there, but I was, I've was. i been seeing reports from people who were there. And um, so I decided to contact the organizer, Garrett Kirkland. He's here with us tonight on the show. He's a 33-year-old activist, and he's an organizer, and he's a native to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He's a left-leaning libertarian, and he's been doing marches and rallies for about a decade including End the Fed, Defend the Fourth, and Hands Off Syria. He most recently helped organize this rally I'm talking about, which is known as Boston Free Speech Rally, on August 19th, which ironically attracted over 40,000 people protesting an officially permitted rally honoring free speech. And I hope uh, Garrett's with us now. Garrett, are you on the line? Hi, Rachel. Yes, I'm here. Oh, right on. Good, good. Okay, listen, thank you so much for being with us. I do appreciate this because I really was confused about what the whole thing was going on last weekend. And if you could kind of run us through, the listeners and me, because I'm equally as confused, what last weekend was all about, at least from your perspective, the person that pulled the permits for the rally that was going on. Sure. Uh, well, I didn't actually pull the permits myself. I'm you know, part of a team of organizers. Um, but the rally itself was literally um, an affirmation of the right, you know, of people to peaceably assemble and exercise their free speech, um, you know, to discuss their own political beliefs. And it really was that simple. It was supposed okay. to be that simple. All right. And when did this uh, permit for this rally get put in? So we had initially filed the permit back in July, um, mm-hmm. but the permit, for whatever reason, um, it didn't seem to to get any progress in City Hall um, up until last week, um, you know, the, the City Hall claimed that they didn't receive the permit, but we did file it back in July, and they, they finally, you know, they got it and they stamped it through um, last week. We filed in July. Okay, okay. And who were the speakers that you originally had on the docket? Uh, so the original, the main line speakers, uh, the main speakers for the original lineup was supposed to be um, Kyle Chapman, Augustus Invictus, um, Dr. Shiva Ayadurai, um, Cassandra Fairbanks, Gavin McInnes, and Joe Biggs. Okay. Are any of those people, you know, your standard issue white supremacist KKK types? Uh, none of them are um, white supremacist KKK white nationalist types at all. Ah. Then what was what was this all about with with was it a direct response to the Charlottesville thing? Why was the news making 
Because I, I, I'm like a news junkie. I'm always looking at Twitter and I'm looking at the news. Heck, I even won't look at the ties that people are wearing on the news. I'm really into looking at the news. And I was of the opinion that this was uh, organized by people who were involved in that movement because at Charlottesville, as it was going on, the news, you know how they send those little, like the little headers under the news about the little splash headlines. They were announcing there were nine more rallies next weekend planned. As you're looking at the, the carnage going on in Charlottesville, um, nine more rallies next weekend. It was like a big headline. So that's why I thought your rally was associated. Yeah, we, we had, um, you know, no association to any of the, the white nationalists or the, even the extreme right rallies. Um, you know, we were simply, we're simply a nonpartisan group and we, you know, just want to affirm free speech. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a drastic increase in political violence against, you know, typically aiming it against, you know, the, the Trump supporters and the conservatives, um, you know, groups that organize and use violence and force and threats to silence them and prevent them from using their speech. Um, so that's where the original, um, motivation for the Boston free speech movement started. Um, but it's by no means a partisan organization. Um, you know, we want to affirm the rights of all people to speak. Okay. So um, I did notice on the YouTube of the, you guys were in the, the little bandstand. They had the big uh, police barrier. What was it? You said 40 yards out. And then all the people were gathering up, up on the hill or all around you, basically. Did did you feel threatened or did you know that they were was you that they were upset with or did you think they were, what did you think was going on when you saw all these people? Oh, we had, um, we had known that they were all coming out to counter protest us. Um, when we were watching the, the crowds gather, we knew that they were, uh, you know, quite displeased with us based on the information that was fed to them through mainstream media um, and through the city of Boston in particular. Uh, so I mean, we had, we had no no disillusion to the fact that, you know, these people were, were, were out there specifically against us. Um, you know, we like to think that's because they were misinformed rather than specifically being malicious. Okay. So did you have militia there? Militia? Uh, we didn't, we didn't have any official militia there. I mean, we, we have oh, okay. constitutionalists there, um, but I mean, we okay. didn't have any, you know, anybody come out in, you know, militia garb or anything like that. Wow, this is just amazing that this happened like this. Um, and I, I'm giving the people credit that were there protesting because God love them. They don't want people to be. It's almost we're living in bizarre world where you if you want to. It's almost like it's backwards world, like the people that want free speech and they want. How do you describe those anti-fascist people? How, what's, what are they called? Anti. Antifa. Yeah. How, 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 what's that all about? How do, how do they fit in? Because they seem like they're very violent. Yep. So Antifa is probably the most direct cause for a, uh, a free speech movement to even be kicking up. Um, particularly in our instance, you know, we've been watching over the past, you know, year to two years, the violence that's been directed against, you know, Trump supporters. And it's only you know, really magnified and amplified since January 20 when Trump was actually put into office. Um, we've been watching as, you know, regular conservatives and Republicans and people of, you know, varying political ideologies that are not on the quote-unquote left, um, you know, just being attacked and deplatformed, um, you know, and silenced through, through means of violence. Um, so we would characterize Antifa as a um, terrorist organization, you know, using violence to silence people and deprive them of their, you know, basic fundamental human rights that are, you know, enshrined in the First Amendment. Okay, now I'm I'm going to be completely just clueless about this stuff because I honestly feel like it, there's just too much to process. Are these people that you just re- talked? Are they? Do they think of themselves as anarchists, or what? What is? What's their? Do they even fit into a political thing? Yeah, they see. So Antifa sees itself as a um, uh, as an anarchist kind of faction. Um, you know, they have a lot of Marxists mixed into it. So it's a mix between like anarchists and communists. Um, and they mm-hmm. they some of them earnestly believe that you know using violence to silence and deplatform their political opponents is going to stop the rise of fascism. They they really think that they are you know on the front line, preventing the next Nazi Germany from happening. Okay. Now, I heard reports where people said that Antifa had filled up, um, like, water bottles of urine and were throwing it. 
yeah. at, at the police or you or whoever. Did, can you comment on that? Um, so I didn't witness any um, directly myself. So we were, you know, if you saw the aerial footage from from the de- from Saturday, the gazebo was was completely isolated by you know the police forces. But yeah, we were pretty far away. We were like two hundred feet away from you know the counter protesters. So even if their intent was to throw bottles of urine at us, they they wouldn't have been able to do so because we were too far away. Um, I did see tweets coming out from. The Boston police force, um, you know, asking, you know, people not to throw, you know, bottles of urine and rocks at their officers. Um, and I saw pictures of, of yellow, of bottles with yellow liquid in it, you know, being thrown at people. Uh, but it, they didn't get into specification of what it was. I'm going to assume it was probably the urine that was promised, um, you know, throughout the week that we're going to be throwing at people. Oh, so they announced it in the beforehand that they were going to do that? Oh yeah, there was all all through the week um, running up to the actual rally. There was um, you know calls online um, for people to, to fill up bottles of urine to throw at you know to throw at the Nazis and the Klan and this that and the other thing. Um, so there there was no you know, there was no illusion that they were not going to come and start doing that. Um, so yeah, it was very it was very, it was very much telegraphed. Wow, were you afraid when you walked up to that platform? I mean, it was a fairly nerve-wracking experience. Um, you know, we, we realized the mobs that were going to be amassing around us. Um, but at the same time, if, if, if we really do believe in the freedom of speech, you know, in the right to peaceful assembly, you know, the American people of all, you know, persuasions and political ideologies need to feel, you know, that they can actually come out and, and, and speak and assemble. And we shouldn't have to be afraid, you know, of, of violence and, and, and being attacked you know, to keep us from coming out and speaking. So, I mean, we felt like we had to do it. Right, right, right. Um, now, did you have a PA system? I'm hearing people say you couldn't even hear them. It didn't even matter if they were there or not. I mean, did, I saw uh, people talking on a bullhorn, the little few of the clips that I saw of you guys in the pavilion. You had a bullhorn, but did, did you think to bring a PA or no? We did consider um, bringing a PA so we'd have – you know, a legitimate sound system. Um, but considering the, the situation that was developing over the past week, we decided that it would be best, um, you know, not to bring anything that we couldn't immediately, you know, pick up and go with. Um, cause we, we had, we didn't really have any, you know, illusion that, that this wouldn't be shut down by, by the counter mobs. Um, so we figured that, you know, anything that we're not willing to leave behind or anything that we can't pick up and go with quickly, you know, shouldn't come. And did you have to pick up and go quickly? Yes. Um, oh God! Tell us about, about that. Yeah. So our our event was scheduled. The actual speaking part of our event was supposed to be between you know twelve and two o'clock. Um, somewhere, I believe it was after one. Um, the Boston police came to us. This is so. It, at this time, there was in the park. There was maybe fifteen to twenty thousand people already you know amassed, and that's those those pictures from overhead where you see the gazebo and then just like the a sea of people surrounding us. Um, the police came to us and they said, hey, there's a, a counter march coming down Tremont Street with another twenty to 30,000 people. Um, and at that point, first they offered, you know, do you want to shut down or do you want to continue? And, of course, we were like, no, we don't want to shut down. We want to, you know, have our spe- finish our speakers, you know, record them so we can put them out online later. Um, but then the police insisted and, and, and pretty much forced us to go ahead and pull the plug, um, which I'm not going to hold against them because it was probably the right decision, considering that now we were looking at, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand people in the park, twenty to thirty thousand people coming down Tremont Street. So you're dealing with, you know, forty five to fifty thousand people all coming out to silence us. Um so at that point, you know, the, the police said it's time to go. We we grabbed everything and, and ran over to the um the paddy wagons that were waiting to pull us out. Wow. So you were in a paddy wagon. And they drove yep. you away. So they, the police. The police drove you away. Yes. They um they set up a, a, an escape tunnel out the back from the bandstand um, that they had kept secured where they, where they queued up some paddy wagons. Um, they extracted us through those wagons through the crowds. I don't know if you've been able to see any of the footage, but they actually had um, phalanxes of, of riot cops ahead of the paddy wagons to push the crowds out of the way so that they could get us out. And all the meanwhile, we're hearing you know the crowd yelling, basically yelling for blood, you know, let them out, make them walk, this, that, and the other thing. 
obviously knowing what that would what that would lead to if we were forced to walk out through that crowd without you know any kind of protection. But yeah, we were stuffed into the paddy wagons to be extra, uh, to be exfiltrated, you know, by by the police and and surrounded by riot cops. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. I cannot even imagine. Okay, so did you get to speak? Personally? I did get to speak. I, yeah, I actually got to speak. Um, okay. So I months ago or like a month or two months ago when um, this was originally being planned, because I was kind of late to the organizing team. Um, so originally I was just going to be a speaker. Um, and my plan was, you know, I wanted to go there and speak about the, um, you know, the Palestinian cause, the BDS movement, where um, there's multiple states, as we speak, and the federal government that are trying to outlaw calling for um, boycotts against a foreign nation. And the ACLU went ahead and, and, you know, they made statements about this saying that, you know, Calling for a boycott is is a First Amendment right. You know, it's a peaceful means to to demonstrate to stand up for what you believe and demonstrate displeasure in something. You know that that is strictly limited to speech. Um, but there are laws and stuff coming up through various state governments and federal governments to outlaw that kind of thing. So you can't say like, you know, you shouldn't do business with this company because they you know oppress Palestinians. Um, so myself being an anti-war, left-leaning, pro-Palestine green. It's a cause that's very important to me, and I see, you know, there's a much bigger picture that if they start outlawing what you can and cannot call for boycotts against, then, you know, things like, you know, back in the 80s with apartheid South Africa, or maybe it was the 80s, I'm not sure, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to call and say, hey, I agree, they disagree with what that country is doing to those people, and we shouldn't do business with them. They would make that criminally, criminally against the law, um, and, you know, that's, like the ACLU says, that's an infringement upon the First Amendment. Uh, so that's what I went out there to speak, and I actually get a chance to deliver that speech. Good, good. My uh, kids just this past year at school, they wrote uh, essays about that boycott in South Africa. So I sort of know what you're talking about. And so right now, as far as boycotting, are they what you just said? You could still talk or no? Um, are you, yes, I was are able you, to talk. Okay, good, good. All right, and you got to say the whole speech. That's good. And did that get documented? Is it on YouTube or something? It got yes. I, I know Kyle Chapman picked it up on his his live stream. Um, now, mind you, a lot of these guys that were up there, you know, conservatives, libertarians, they lean a bit more to the right, um, you know, and I'm I'm definitely more to the left than any of them. Um, mm-hmm. But I was able to give my speech to them, and my my intent was to you know to talk to these people that you know aren't necessarily aligned with me ideologically and explain to them, hey, you know, there are there are multiple assaults on the First Amendment as we you know as we're moving forward here. That affect both left, you know, left-leaning people and right-leaning people, and like, it's time to really get past our, you know, our politics and and state and focus on these basic principles and these basic rights. Uh, so I was able to give the speech, and I think I was actually pretty well received, even by you know my right-leaning friends that were up there on stage. Right. Okay. Great. Good. Good. Now the little uh, clips I saw on YouTube, people are holding uh, like stop Man- Monsanto signs. Those people are there too. Um, so yeah, it did seem it was like quite a Solomon Gundy of different voices that you had included in your speech, uh, in your, in your protest. Now, you said you were just, you, you were late to the game and there were, you were not, there's more than one organizer. Who are the other organizers? Uh, well, so due to, you know, due to the, the, the threats and, um, you know, malicious lies that are going on around about people. Um, not everybody wants to necessarily be named publicly. Um, okay. But one person I will, um, you know, give credit to who has been, you know, in the public eye was John Medler. He was he was very involved in the organizing, um, pulling a lot of stuff together, including the permits. Okay. And um, is he right wing, alt right? Is he any of this Nazi white supremacist stuff? No, um, he describes himself as as a libertarian. He's a libertarian. Okay. Wow. Wow. People really got bamboozled, huh, by the press. Now, is there any way to hold the press liable for any of this? Because the city of Boston must have spent a ton of money to deal with all this. Oh, the, the city of Boston definitely put a ton of money in. I mean, they, they shut down the entire park. Um, all the, the city vendors were able to come out, the police forces, the logistics involved. Um, there was a ton of money put into, in, into this. I don't even know how to describe it. This, this hype, this hype fest, um, you know, that surrounded us. Um, so I'm not sure about, you know, what avenues can be pursued, um, as far as holding, you know, various entities to account. Um, but they will be. Yeah, because they were all uh, in on it. Everybody was in on it. All the big media was. 
Yeah, it seemed like the entire you know left establishment was was entirely gain, um, you know gunning for you know painting us as a certain thing that we were not and shutting us down on the the principle the pretext that we were that thing that again we were not. Wow. So it definitely seems okay, like yeah. you know, there should be some kind of recourse. Okay, because when I first started talking about this with people that I was going to be interviewing you, people were like, "Oh, he's probably just some guy just trying to you know." pick on a scab, you know, he's one of those people that's just trying to be like a smart ass, you know, and I was like, D- I don't think that's it. I can't wait to talk to him, but I don't think that's it. So I, I, seeing that you're into Edna Fed, defend the fourth, hands off Syria and the whole thing with Palestine, I'm getting an idea that has nothing to do with it. You weren't just at being an agitator just to be in people's face. No, no, no. I, I like to consider myself a constitutionalist. Um, you know, I started my political career as a Ron Paul Republican. Um, I, I take the Bill of Rights extremely seriously, um, including for my opponents. Um, you know, so I will go ahead and I will defend the people that I don't agree with um, based on their fundamental rights, you know, under the First Amendment to go ahead and speak and to be able to peaceably assemble. And that's that's literally what brought me over there. OK, yeah. Um, now, as far as the mayor of Boston goes. Do you think, being a politician, that he stood up and was fiery about this whole thing just to get himself more, I don't know, notoriety or something? Or What do you think that was all about? Oh, I, I definitely think that um, many of the political people involved, um, you know, marching against us from, you know, Maura Healy to Marty Walsh, um, I definitely think that they were out to score, you know, opportunistic political points for themselves. Um, I know Marty's up for re-election. Um, unless I'm mistaken, I'm pretty sure Marty's up for re-election this year or next year. Um, so I definitely see that he wanted some political points for himself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Now, what is what do you think is the most important thing for people to focus on right now? Because obviously things are pretty uh, torn apart. Like everything seems like it's a mess. Was <laughs> it from my point of view? Um, especially after seeing this uh, thing last weekend, it does seem everybody's. They're trying to fracture everybody. They're trying to get everybody in different camps. You're either a good book guy or a bad guy, and they're breaking it down like that. But what do you think is the most important thing people as Americans should be focused on right now while all this confusion is going on? I really think that. People in this country of, you know, again, of all persuasions, of all ideologies, really need to start talking to their political opponents, to start listening to people they don't agree with. Even if they say horrendous things, listen to what they have to say and try to understand where they're coming from or where they're, even if they're incorrect ideas, where these ideas are coming from. Um, Only through dialogue are we going to be able to avoid, you know, further polarization, further, further radicalization, and further violence. Um, so I think that's really the most important thing that I really want to stress to people is, you know, listen to your enemies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's good. That's excellent advice. Now, as I was watching this, of course, it happened in Boston. The last time I saw something like that happen in Boston was the Women's March. How would you equate what you saw at your rally to the Women's March? Do they even compare? Or are they two different things? I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of overlap between um, the organizations that came out for it and, you know, the political parties involved, the ideologies involved. Um, I mean, I think it's the same contrived fake resistance um, that we've been seeing for the past, you know, half year, or however long Trump's been in office. Um, I pretty much expect that all of them probably were involved or um, directly or indirectly with, like, the Women's March and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, because the media and everything else, you know, tells them, hey, you know, this is how we, we, we speak truth to power. This is, this is how we oppose, you know, whatever agenda. But looking at it from, from my perspective, I'm just seeing you know, these people being strung along just to play their part, um, just to further radicalize and polarize our, our different factions against each other. Yeah. Okay. Well said. Well said. Um, here's my next thing. You said you took, put this uh, in the permits in, in July. They didn't, they seemed like they got lost. And then it was a week before that they actually gave you the permit. But they knew what you were doing and they said, said, yeah, go ahead. And is that when the trouble started kicking up? Was it, I'm trying to think how many days before or after Charlottesville did it start kicking up for you? Or was it right that day? 
the the, the bad stuff being. It, it must it must have been like either so Charlottesville was on a Saturday. I mean, it must have been either Sunday or the latest Monday when you know the crap storm just started kicking up and and building upon itself, and you know people started to start hyping up this rage about you know all. Those those clan people, those white nationalists, the the unite the right people, they're all coming here now. Next, um, so I mean that must have kicked up about Sunday or Monday. It was, it was pretty swiftly right after Charlottesville. Uh huh. Uh huh. Of course, uh, Charlottesville is its own ball of wax. I know that people are investigating that right now too. Whether that's a whole nother show we're going to have to do, but um. So you are. You, let's just say it again. You had nothing to do with Charlottesville. Yeah, we had zero to do with Charlottesville. Um, we had, you know, previously before the Charlottesville event, um, we had actually changed the date of our free speech rally so that it would not align with the, the Charlottesville rally that was happening because we intentionally and consciously were trying to distance ourselves from, you know, a, a radical right kind of, you know, perspective. We wanted, we are, we're earnestly wanted to be a, you know, a nonpartisan, a, an inclusive group, um, you know, because again, you know, free speech is for everybody. So we intentionally took steps before the tragedy of Charlottesville, um, you know, to, to go ahead and try to distance ourselves from, you know, unite the right or that, you know, specifically right wing kind of, um, you know, faction. All right. I watched how I even got in touch with you is a friend of mine who had gone to the march. He had brought his camera and he wanted to take pictures. He, he, he wanted to be at your rally. He went to go listen to free speech. And next thing you know, he was caught in the mob outside. He was trying to take pictures. And I, he sent me the link to you talking about your experience that day. And in the background behind you, you had a flag, a green flag. And you said it's Ke- Kekistan? Ke- Kirk? Ke- K-E-K? Yeah, the Kekistani flag. Yeah, can you tell us about that? Because I had somebody else tell me about that, and it was very interesting. She took it way down a rabbit hole. But I wanted to know, because there were some people, like InfoWars had something on with this guy who was out with the protesters, and he was dressed up as, I don't know, he was, it was kind of like a Mardi Gras kind of thing going on, and he had a flag of that on him, and somebody's yelling at him that that's a Nazi flag, and he's going nuts. And he's like, no, it's not. So can you explain what that flag is? Yeah, so the the green Kekistan flag is uh, it, 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 there's this this series of memes that have come up um you know with with Pepe the Frog and with with Kekistan. Basically the what people call SJWs, the um uh, you know your your quote unquote snowflakes, they're so caught up in, you know, everything's a Nazi, everything's offensive, everything is, you know, boiled down to identity politics and progressive stacks and, you know, these are your labels, these, you know, these are who's oppressing who. The idea of the Kekistan flag and the, the you know, the, the Pepe memes and stuff is to literally just disavow all of it and just make a joke out of everybody who's getting all riled up about Nazis, this, that, and the other thing. Like, this is, you know, stop taking yourself so seriously. And it's literally just that. Just stop taking everything so seriously. Not everybody's a Nazi. Not everything has hidden meanings. You know, this identity politics has taken us all apart. And it's not just aimed at the left-wing identity politics. It's also aimed to make fun of the right-wing identity politics, your white nationalists, this, that, and the other thing. It's literally just to make fun of everybody who takes their identity and their labels too seriously. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, all right. But that was not your personal motivation. Your personal motivation was the Palestine issue. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So okay, in, in so you, May, yeah, well, had, you, well, you weren't just like making fun of people, like, aha, I'm going to do this thing. It's, you were serious about this, uh, the civil rights stuff and you're serious about Palestine. Well, I, okay, I just want to get that absolutely. out over the record. Right on. All right, now, what, like I told you before, somebody was giving a speech. It was Dr. Shiva Ayadure, and he literally blew my mind. Yeah, he's on the phone right now with us, right on. This mob of over 40,000 people chanted in opposition to the rally he was speaking at. So, Dr. Shiva, thank you for being with us. I'm sure you've got a ton of stuff to do. You're like a wonder. I, I can't, first off, I can't believe I'm talking to the man that invented email. So thank you for that, first off. And second off, please tell us about your experience at this rally. Well, first of all, you know, I, I just want to appreciate the young, you know, high school students and students are the ones who organize this. 
and uh, Garrett was uh, activists like him organize this. And I'm just so appreciative because we need, you know, people to participate in politics in this country. And the sincerity and the intellectual breadth that I saw among these people is just incredible. So I was just so honored to be among them. First of all, I just want to say that. So I had agreed to do this, I think, about a six or eight, a month and a half ago. I get a lot of different talks I get invited to. It was after Charlottesville is when um, people started calling us, me, you know, the, uh, an Indian community newspaper said I'm a Nazi, a white supremacist, and uh, put this out broadly. In fact, one of them uh, who I just spoke to just pulled it down after they saw the facts and just um, gave us an interview, which will probably be going live. But what we witnessed was when we went in, Garrett may have shared this, that, you know, the activists were given a permit for 100 inside the inner bandstand and the fence around it. We were supposed to be allowed up to 100 people in the outer area, you know, with supporters and the press. The press was forcibly kept out, and I don't blame the police. This came, in my opinion, from the Baker administration and Marty Walsh, who were all one-upping each other and how much they were fighters against racism and white supremacy. Basically, the politicians took advantage of this. The media went along for the ride, and we and the police were the ones who could have been killed in this. Right. And that's what's so unfortunate. Right. The, uh, now, the, the events you, in the bandstand were absolutely peaceful. The two people that the organizer invented, the two deaconesses, gave a beautiful speech. If anything, it was hippie-like of a message of love, and they did a little uh, ceremony, a, a smudging ceremony. They did a moment of silence, and then I spoke. And I think, you know, the administration, the establishment, didn't want people to hear the fact that a dark-skinned Indian guy was going to talk about white supremacy in a much broader sense, except Clinton, who, you know, called black children uh, super predators. You know, people like uh, Jimmy Carter, who said that we need ethnically clean neighborhoods. So the academic elites and the establishment have narrowed white supremacy to people in, you know, white, uh, whatever, pillowcases, and some, someone wearing a, a swastika, which, by the way, is a Hindu symbol also, which is another story. But the... The narrowing of intellectual debate, the narrowing of uh, intellectual argument is what the students wanted to really expand, and they did a noble thing, and we as people went in there, frankly, we risked our lives, and I would do it again, and I know all of us would do it again, but we did it for the right reason, to protect one of the most important um, you know, uh, principles that the founders of this country set up and why my parents left India. Right on. Well... Thank you for saying all that. That's excellent. Now, here's here's my question to you. You gave this speech, and while you were talking, um, I saw people holding up on YouTube, holding up the uh, Mon- Stop Monsanto banners. You had a good point to make about academia and how people would change their their research to fit certain corporations. Could you talk about a little bit more here on the show about that? Sure. You know, I've been in and out of academia since 81 as a student, graduate student, lecturer, in and out of MIT. I've been a research scientist there, a visiting scientist. And what has happened, probably starting post-World War II in academia, is academia was a place where people went to to have, quote-unquote, academic freedom. You know, but what has occurred over the last 50 years is that they call out anyone who's actually a radical or wants to make a statement. And this is a reality. You know, when I did my research using technology I built at MIT, which clearly showed that genetically engineered foods are not the same as organic foods, particularly soy. We published it. Monsanto uh, got very upset. They unleashed their academics at University of Florida, people like Harvard, to say that, that our research was flawed, etc. And then, fortunately, a, a, a nonprofit group on the West Coast um, found uh, 4,000 emails from the University of Florida where a professor who was claiming he was an independent scientist, a guy called Kevin Folta, had in fact gotten money from Monsanto, and throughout it, he was claiming he was an independent scientist while attacking us. What we have now is pay-to-play science. There is no academic freedom. And, uh, and, and typically at the bigger institutions, uh, MIT, Harvard, Yale, etc., and these are the same people that are basically constraining the debate and argument and labeling people as Nazis or white supremacists. But if you say you support Trump, you say anything against Hillary Clinton, you're considered an anti-intellectual. And basically what we have now in academia, by and large, not to say everyone's bad, but by and large, 
is basically a bunch of lemmings who are involved in academia. And Monsanto is a stellar example of that. Excellent. Now, the reason why I'm interested in this is because I just recently interviewed um, Ken Caldera, who uh, is from the UN. He's the author of that climate change report, that the UN climate change report that um, has everybody kind of shuffling around in academia, especially MIT and Harvard. They're coming up with plans to change, uh, try to change the atmosphere uh, to for geoengineering purposes. And so what you're saying is some of the stuff that is rejiggered so that the funding comes along or doesn't come along, or they're controlling the – so I'm just trying to overlay the, the climate change stuff because it seems very similar to what you just res- – Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You bring up – look, what's interesting is people are thinking that you can't wear a MAGA hat, drape the American flag, be against Monsanto, and in fact, as – Clearly, you know, as I've exposed that genetically engineered foods are, have no safety assessment standards over a series of five scientific papers, which people in the liberal and the yoga people and the uh, organic people love me for doing that. At the same time, I also came out against the Paris Accords because the Paris right. Accords have nothing to do with cleaning the environment. What they have to do is with the helping enriching the bushes, the IPCC, and the gores in imposing a carbon tax. And the, the Paris Accords uh, fundamentally allow China, just as one country, to pollute another 11 billion carbon tons until 2030, and then they have to start paying carbon tax. And that carbon, um, you know, uh, uh, tax or th- is, is essentially being traded as an equity. So it's going to explosively grow in value post 20, um, you know, 2030. And that's what they positioned as. So the carbon. So if we really want to. I'm not going to argue whether climate change is going on or not. Let's just put that aside, and I have my position on that. But the reality is if you want to help the environment, it's innovation. It's not the Paris Accord. And, by the way, there was a great article. Uh, a, a good uh, colleague of mine wrote an American thinker saying the new 15 is the new – or the, the new 15 is the new 14, basically saying how the NASA scientists, he initially, in the early 80s, when a lot of this stuff came out, They said, oh, the average temperature of the Earth is 15 degrees. Well, in 1997, it wasn't growing. It was, in fact, going down. So suddenly in an email, which is a footnote in a New York Times article, this guy changed the average temperature of the Earth to 14. And then they said, oh, the Earth's temperature is now 14.6. My point is there's money involved in purporting that climate change is taking place. And that money is involved uh, very closely associated with the Paris Accords, and the Green Fund was going to be used by American taxpayer dollars basically to fund corrupt officials in 190 countries so they would join the Paris Accord. It's a complete scam. It has nothing <laughs> to do with helping the climate change or climate, you know, helping to you know, address pollution. Yeah, right, right. Oh, I'm so glad you're talking to us about this. This is fantastic. Uh, i got to check that out. Um, where would you point people to look if they're interested in what you just said and just it's like news oh, to them uh, so to hear I, this. Yeah, so I've done a re- – if you people just want to type in my net last name, Ayadore, Shiva, A-Y-Y-A-D-R-A-I, type in Paris Accord, and I did a very nice educational video, uh, you know, using systems visualization and diagrams. People can see it. I go point by point by point, and I explain it, and the evidence there is pretty clear to anyone who wants to look at it rationally without being religious. Uh, which is what's happened with with uh, people who hold religious views. There's a new priesthood now. People don't look at things rationally. Same with GMOs. There's if you go to the uh, International Center for Integrative Systems, IntegrativeSystems.org, we've published all of our five papers, which have been published in uh, journals that Monsanto and the USDA also publish in. Uh, but the, but the bottom line is. We have an opportunity with what occurred on April 19th at that Boston Free Speech Rally to people really to step back and realize that they need to go within themselves. They need to start using their own mind, their own reasoning capabilities, and stop listening to nonprofits, NGOs, uh, you know, organizations which tell them what to think. And that's what's going on. Finite set of people think everyone's stupid and they're smart, that they think someone um, you know, is going to do a Heil Hitler sign, that they can't make their own decision whether that person they should listen to or not. That's the fundamental problem. We have people like Elizabeth Warren, uh, who I'm running against, who's telling, who thinks she's smarter than everyone. 
that she's going to fight for us. The reality is we each have to fight for ourselves um, by using our own mind and, and reasoning capabilities, which is what the founders of this country wanted. Right. Now, you just said some of the NGOs and the nonprofits, they're the ones, it seems, that are funneling their information to the press. So the press must have a connection with this type of money that's floating around. Obviously, they get uh, advertising money. Um, well, well how, look, how I was in... Go Look, I, you know, I've been at, in, within the military industrial complex at MIT and I was at Hollywood for about three years when I was out there in a relationship. What I can tell you is all of these people hang out. Of, it, it's more of an implicit engagement. OK, if you're in New York, you know, all of these the quote unquote Republicans and the quote unquote Democrats literally hang out together. They are incestuous together in many, many ways. Um, they're all buddies. OK, so it's all implicit as well as explicit arrangements that they have. And they're all one little clan. And it's basically a big echo chamber. And mm -hmm. in many ways, Trump was a not part of that echo chamber, you see. And that's what people need to understand. You know, I never voted in my life. Uh, I broke with, with any idea of the establishment when I was 18, 19, when I saw Jesse Jackson, who I thought was independent, hand all of his votes to Walter Mondale. And when Trump ran, I voted for him, primarily for the reason he was a necessary disruption to a system which was being controlled by a few set of people. So I think we need disruption. I think we need to get rid of all of these career politicians. I think everyday mm -hmm. people should be participating in politics. We need to start um, really looking at, you know, why are people going to college and getting these, uh, getting forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars student loans? What are they really learning? And it's it's a foundational uh, relook we need to do and realize that we're all being bamboozled by people who want to claim they're fighting for the minorities fighting for the quote unquote darkies fighting for you know uh you know poor people when these people are actually taking advantage of them that's what's really yeah. going on and that's what we saw at the boston free speech rally charlie baker who needs to win a uh, marty walsh who needs to win they used us they used the police and shame on them not shame on us shame on them yeah now what would you say for the people that went to the march they had their signs up you know hate you know don't hate people and to have their signs what would you say to them right now personally now if they're just hearing this because they didn't know what was going on in that pavilion what would you say to them well i think look there were in my so what i would say to them the sincere people who came to protest which they have every right to do what i would say to them is we have a huge opportunity we're at a crossroads in american history to go into what i say the light or to the darkness and it's really up to them to start listening and really reflecting on what took place on August 19th, that people came in there in peace to really discuss a spectrum of views and that they were bamboozled. And they need to start looking at who bamboozled them and what were their motivations. And I'm not going to tell them. I have my own opinion, which I've shared, but they need to reflect on that. And are they going to be sheep? Are they going to be used? Are they going to be really true to what this country was about? Because they were all taken advantage of. What they care about is getting elected the inner cities in Massachusetts where they claim they want to help poor blacks and poor whites. And there are poor whites in this country, too. Let's not forget that. It's not just poor mm -hmm. blacks, but a lot of poor whites. And those poor whites are the ones who voted for Donald Trump because the so-called elite, Obama, and the and on the East Coast and the West Coast, were not paying attention to them. And to call them, you know, uh, KK people uh, and white and nationalists when they stand up for their rights also is also a form of racism. And we need to really look at this in a much more truthful manner. So all those people listening, drop your label as liberals, drop your label as left or right, because it's all BS. These labels have been created by politicians to split us. And you need to start looking at this using your brain, which God gave each one of us. That's my okay. message. Yeah, that's a good message. That's a good message. So if these people, and I'm just going to make something up here, let's say they went, they don't like Donald Trump. They don't like him. They're just anti him because of the last election. They're just still very upset that he's even our president. How would you help them get over that hump and focus on other things? Like there, there's tons of things that Americans should be worried about right now besides Donald Trump himself. What are some of the other things that maybe they should focus on instead? Well, well, I, look, I, I, I think the opportunities, you know, people have this visceral reaction against Trump and that mm -hmm. as though uh, uh, 
Hillary uh, deserved to win. I, I, I do think there's an opportunity for people to really sit down, maybe go next to a river under a tree, as we say in India, meditate, and really observe their feelings in their own body. Where is that coming from? Where is that really coming from? And their intention to basically attack the democratic system which elected him, where is that coming from? And, what, and I believe if they sincerely look at that, it'll come from their own arrogance, that they believe everyone else is stupid and they're smart. That's where that arrogance is coming from, that they believe that they've been essentially duped by the media. And I think they need to listen to that and, and really, really reflect on that, because that visceral response, all this emotional outpouring, all this anti-Trump hatred, I don't think that hatred and that reaction is not against Trump, where it's really coming from is they lost control. You know, the opposite of love is not hate, it's control. And what happened was these people who think they're so morally better than everyone, a form of moral narcissism, are really upset because the everyday person didn't listen to their ideas. And it's really, they need to reflect on themselves to think, where do they think they have the hubris to think they're so much smarter, that everyone else is stupid? And you're talking to someone, like you said, who has four degrees from MIT. But I also came from everyday working people. My grandparents were poor farmers in India. And they need to understand those people actually have a gut-level common sense. And they don't need to be told what to do. And those people who have this visceral response, they need to really reflect on that. And they need to really understand that maybe they're arrogant. Maybe they are the ones who are actually have certain fascistic tendencies. And I think that needs to occur because that's anti-American. And that's what I have to say. And if they want to distract themselves, you know, they should really probably go read a range of books. Let them read all different kinds of books. Let them, you know, come to my event. You know, we hold, uh, I hold monthly events. I'm actually going to hold an educational forum as a person of color. What is white supremacy? And let them come to that. Not read their what? books by the same old echo chamber. Right. Let's when talk is about that? Why I believe, well, let's talk about why I believe Hillary Clinton is a white supremacist. She is a white supremacist. Let's talk about that. Now, that may seem shocking. Oh, 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 he's saying that. You know, they need to think about that. Harry Reid is a white supremacist. And and you can be a white supremacist um, in all different shades of Republicans and Democrats. And as a person of color who I think, you know, I've gone through the journey, which many of those have not. I come from a low caste, untouchable, dark skinned Indian background. I actually represent the 5 billion people that these liberals and these nonprofits claim they want to help. I'm the guy that you want to help if you're listening to this. So don't tell me that what I'm saying is wrong, because that means you want to keep me on a plantation. Tell me what to think. That's racism. Right. And now, what, the problem they you... have with someone like me is that yeah. I am the person who somehow made it. I'm the anomaly, you know, that they claim they want to help. So if you want to help me, I'm here. So now I'm here to teach you something which is you need to get off your soapbox and realize that perhaps you're racist. Perhaps you have white supremacy in you because you can't tell this guy who's frankly not willing to be a house slave how to think because most people of color have been brought into being Uncle Tom, and I'm not willing to be an Uncle Tom. I'm not willing to be a good Indian. You know, uh, Hillary Clinton made fun of Mahatma Gandhi. There's a video of her doing that. So we need to really look at who is a white supremacist here. And I want the, the liberals who thought we were white supremacists to go look in the mirror and really take a hard look at themselves. And maybe they're the racist and white supremacists that they try to label the people in that gazebo. Right on. Now, when are you teaching this class? Because, uh, damn it, I'll drive up to we're, Boston. We're, we're going to gonna teach that. it in two weeks. We're going to okay. teach it in two weeks. And it's going to be taught by an untouchable Indian immigrant on my view of what is a white supremacist. And they should come if they are really sincere to understand why Hillary Clinton is a white supremacist, why Harry Reid's a white supremacist, why Jimmy Carter is a white supremacist, why Joe Biden said that he was going to vote for Obama because he was the first clear and articulate black person. Mm -hmm. We need to wake up. We need to wake people up and realize that they are so narrowly focused because the academics in this country think they own uh, intellectual, you know, dialogue. Right on. And that's got to Okay, so, that's gotta so end. your web, your website's V A S H. My my website I is Shiva. Yeah, by the way, I'm running for Senate. Anyone listening to this, give us lots of money because we want to go <laughs> defeat Elizabeth Warren. And I'm I'm not going to be shy about that. 
uh, but we're going to really take care of your money. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a frugal Indian entrepreneur. I spend every penny. I make it go 100x. Uh, we don't pay political consultants. Everywhere we go, people hear our message left or right. They see rational behavior. So Shiva for Senate. My personal website is vashiva.com. Uh, my YouTube is at VA underscore Shiva. Um, I think it's time for people to start using their brain and mind by themselves that God gave them and stop listening to the fake news uh, media. Stop listening to academics who just want to write a paper. They want to get their next funding. They want to get their next proposal. They want to live in their next house and tell their friends after seven years they're, they're an associate or whatever assistant professor. That's why go- those guys' motivation are. What they write has nothing to do with reality by and large. Right on. I'm I'm thrilled that you're saying all this. This is fantastic. And like you said, you do have four degrees from MIT. You are an immig- from an immigrant family. Um, you're of color, and I can't believe that I want you to win. I don't. I, this is the first time I've ever ever been exposed to you. And I'll send you a donation. I want you to win. This is fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Look, Thank you for showing up on this show. Yeah, the founders of this country were blacksmiths, architects, inventors, everyday people. They worked for a living. We need to kick every one of these politicians out. They do not work. They work only to get votes, and that's all they do. You know, in the Republican Party, there's old Beth Lindstrom running. She made, she ran lottery. What is the lottery? It's a tax on poor people. That's her claim to fame. We have a guy called Fake Deal who photoshopped a picture of himself shaking hands with Trump. Fake Photoshop picture. And then we got old man Kingston. And then we have you know, fake Indian Warren. And these people are all fake. They don't do anything. You know, I, I believe in term limits. We need to get back to the foundations. People work. They serve. Senator is not a career. You know, you, you serve and you head back to the farm and you get back to working. And that's we, the people, need to take back our government. And Trump threw a big bomb to start that. Whether you like him or not, he was a necessary disruption. And now it's time for people to rise up and take back their government from all of these swamp creatures. That's what they are. They do not deserve our votes, Republicans and Democrats, both of them. Right. What would you say to people that have kind of fallen off the, the whole voting thing? Because I know a lot of people, they got blown oh, I, out I, I by the Ron voted. Paul experience. They got blown out by the Hillary experience. They just don't believe in voting at all at this point. What would you say to them? I, I, I totally look. Look, my campaign, I have believed that we as individuals are insignificant, insignificant. But what has changed the course of history has always been movement. You know, uh, when Susan B. Anthony went in front of the Democrats, they laughed at her. The Democrats didn't give us, uh, you know, women rights, women's rights. It was her movement. Uh, Right on. We're going to the break, Dr. Shiva. And when we come back, you can finish up that thought. We'll be right back, everybody. Okay, everyone, we're back. It's the second hour of ShadowCitizen.online at AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Um, we just had our first hour where we had our minds blown by Dr. Shiva Ayadure and Garrett Kirkland, who was the original, one of the original organizers of the Boston Free Speech Rally last weekend. We heard from both of them about how that situation blew up in the press and really got people riled up and there were over 40,000 people marching in protest of a free speech rally. Um, Dr. Shiva is, I, he's still here. I'd like to have him finish up what he was saying. If he can remember what we were talking about, he was blowing my mind. And I did say, I would like to donate to his campaign because he was talking about how things in academia, such as research into seeds, Monsanto has and research into the weather that is all sort of, hinged on all sorts of money that comes through huge corporations. And he had started to talk about how people should still think about the government and voting. I had asked about the people that had kind of fallen off. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, kind of fallen off the wagon with, I'm I'm not going to vote anymore because I I was a Ron Paul person or I was a Hillary Clinton person or one of those. How, How would you, he was starting to tell us about how to deal with that. Well, well, look, I never have ever voted, and I completely empathize with those people who do not vote. Because what I'm learning is by the time the actual vote comes out on the ballot, you know, you have choice A, B, C, D, E. Um, to even get on the ballot by the two major parties, it's a rigged system. You, because they control which, how the delegate process works, how you get signatures, 
and we know in Massachusetts it's take, it takes place in every state. It's a rigged system. So the choices that people get when they go into the quote-unquote voting booth, um, those choices have been made long before that they even come in. And then they collude with the media to promote one candidate or the other. In Massachusetts, you know, I was the first candidate to announce uh, the radio shows like uh, – uh, Howie Carr and Cooner didn't even let me on because they had a deal with a guy called, we call him the fake deal. And then, and then when the establishment decides he's not working out, they'll stick someone else in. So that's the way they work. So I completely empathize with people. But the reason I'm running is because I believe that people like our, everyday people like ourselves running, it's about a movement. And my defeating Elizabeth Warren is to inspire other people that we can beat these people. It's not about, you know, uh, trusting the voting system. Trust me in any manner, because it's a rigged system. But the idea of going to people directly, you know, I'm right now in our bus. We're going up to Rockport to give a talk. Uh, a bunch of students and citizens in Massachusetts actually helped us build our own bus. We call it Real Indian One. And we're literally going to uh, Rockport to give a talk. Uh, we're not, uh, and we're literally going on the ground. Most of these other career politicians have it rigged. They own the delegates, et cetera. It comes top down. So I believe this is about a movement, and the movement that we need right now is about clean government. We need clean air. We need clean food. We need real jobs, real health, and real education. So what I can tell to people is um, I'm not, frankly, running for as senator, right? That's not the goal. The idea is to unleash a movement so we can get back to we the people run our government. So voting for Shiva for Senate is really about unleashing a movement, and I'm, frankly, insignificant in the equation. I'm just a messenger of ideas that I think reflect on what everyday people think about. And that's why we're resonating so well. So think about it yeah. as a movement. It's not about, you know, uh, getting in there in the Senate and trying to pass X, Y, Z bill or not. Right. Now, since we're talking politics, which I don't normally do on this show, are there politicians that once you get in there, let's just assume you get in there, who would you align yourself with? Well, look, you know, I like guys like Rand Paul, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. I think he uses his brain. He actually uh, was a doctor. I think he was an ophthalmologist. He has, uh, obviously, you know, there are other people. You know, there was a guy in there. I don't think he's in there anymore. Bill Frist, who's a transplant surgeon. I think anyone who's had a job before and who doesn't Good need point. this job, I'm going to align myself with. Anyone right. who Good needs point. this job, they're, they're probably enemies of the people because they'll do anything to keep their job because they don't care about, uh, the fact that if they lose their job, uh, they don't have anything to go back to. I can't be bought. There are other people who can't be bought. And the idea is to align ourselves with people who cannot be bought and who, frankly, do not need the job. And that's why Trump is so vociferous, so clear, and he doesn't back down because he doesn't need the job. And I don't need the job. Yeah, right, 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 right. Now, I'm going to swing it back over to Garrett, if he's still on. Garrett, you sure. still around? Huh? Great, good, good. Still now, here. Yeah, good. Listen, in. now did so I'm going to jump everything? off then. If that's, I don't want to. Do you, do you, I'm. Um, do you want me to stay on, or do you want me to go on? Yeah, mute? you can Just stay on. Know. Stay on. We've got another hour okay. if you can. But I. Yeah, I think I'm going to get off because we're about to come to our place. If that's okay. Oh, you're getting off. Okay. okay. All right. All right. All right. Is that okay? Hey, but, thank you. But so, I'll yes, listen in. Of course, I'll, it's okay. I'll, I'll keep listening. I'll keep listening. Okay. Okay. But I got to drive right. the bus now. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you I'll, I'll so much listening. for talking with us. I do appreciate it. Okay. Okay, he's got to go, I guess. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Shiva. Now I'm going to go back to Garrett. Garrett, you around, hon? Yes, I am. Okay, great, great, great. Now I'm shutting Dr. Shiva off, and he's going on his what, group with his on his bus. Um, now you're back with me. Now listening to what he just said about voting. How do you feel about that? Um, oh, man, I might be a glutton for punishment or something, um, but I do vote. I vote mm -hmm. green. Um, the only time I had actually been voting Republican or Democrat um, was back for Ron Paul, but when he didn't get the nomination in 2007 for the 2008 run, I swore off the two-party system. I will not vote for either Republicans or Democrats any longer because just as you know, you guys went through, it's entirely rigged. Both parties are completely rigged from the ground up, from the delegate system to, you know, everything else, the debates and everything. Uh, so I will only vote third parties. And I really do encourage people to vote, you know, for third parties and independents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, 
Um, I'm gonna, uh, you stay on the line with me. I'm gonna offer the line, the phone lines to people to call in and express, if they went to this rally, I wanna hear from you. Um, please do call cool. in. Uh, is that okay? And you could, we could listen to them. Is that alright? With you, Garrett? Yeah, I just wanna make, um, just, I just wanna, um, offer one point of clarification is, um, you know, I was not one of the original organizers. Um, you know, it's, it really was a bunch of young guys, young conservatives, young libertarians that, Pulled together this this free speech movement, uh, so I don't want to you know glory hog or, or or take undue you know credit where I, you know I didn't really earn it. Um, I came in late, and I, I you know so that I could use my experience organizing other stuff to help these guys kind of like get through this really rough spot, you know, especially this past week or so. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the fact that the paperwork was put in for almost a month, and so good for you for getting that out and getting it passed. That's good. I'm glad you did. Thank you. All right, for the people listening, I would like you to call 1-218-339-8525. That's 1-218-339-8525, especially if you were at this rally and you could tell us what you experienced. Um, or if you just watched on TV and now after listening to these people, if you have a new point of view about it, um, that's 218-339-8525. Okay, so Garrett, you and me until somebody calls in and wants to talk with us. So what are you working on right now? Obviously, you're trying to like get your head around what just happened. Um, are you going to be doing another rally? Or are you dealing with legal stuff? What are you doing right now uh, after the rally? Uh, well, right now we are... You know, we're kind of looking forward to when, you know, the next rally will be, uh, when the next action will be. We're not entirely sure what form that will take. Um, you know, as far as any legal stuff, I I think those are avenues to explore. I wouldn't really want to comment on that at this time. Um, but I definitely feel like there's um, there were some potentially illegal things that were, you know, done to us. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're not it's, – it's, it's been a very crazy – crazy, um, you know, week so far, week and a half. Uh, so I, I think a lot of us are really still decompressing and just trying to wrap our minds around, like, how easy it is to whip up a mob into a frenzy with, you know, false information, fake news, this, that, and the other thing. Um, so we're still kind of decompressing everything. Yeah, I would imagine. And you had mentioned that, if I can share this, that you had gotten death threats. Is that true? Well, not, I haven't received, um, explicit death threats. Um, I have, I have definitely received, um, you know, some not, some thinly veiled threats against, you know, my person. Um, I've had people trying to figure out, you know, my places of employment, um, ostensibly so that they could, you know, go and try to get me fired, this, that, and the other thing. Um, I've received a lot of, a lot of heat for, you know, being involved in this at all. Um, so I mean, I have not have sure it's a death threat, but I have definitely received threats of, of varying sorts. Oh, wow. Okay. What about um, the other people that spoke? Do you, have you gotten any feedback from them? Have, do they feel like they were targeted or no? Do you know anything um, about other people? Yeah, it, I, don't, I don't like to speak for other people, um, but I know that a few of our organizers, without you know throwing names out, you know, have been taking significant heat. Um, they've you know been harassed at their you know their, their colleges and stuff have been have been called up. People are threatening to try to get them expelled. Um, people are trying to get people fired. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, of, of dirty tactics at play right now. Um, but, you know, I really don't want to speak for other people, so I'm right. not going to you know, throw other people's names out there. Right, right, right. Well, it sounds like you guys just walked into crazy town. <laughs> what happened there? Um, I'm sort of at a loss for words. So you're going to – you don't you, – you're still into doing this sort of stuff, and it might not be a rally. It might be some sort of action and – Okay, well, name a bunch of different things that people might consider an action. A boycott is an action. Um, what are some of the other things? Are you still on the phone? Uh oh. Rachel? Yay! Is this Garrett? Hey, it's Garrett. I'm back. All right, good, good, good. All right, so what just happened to your phone? I don't think anything happened on my side. I'm not sure. I have no idea. I don't know. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you came back. You thought I could call back. Thank you so much. Yeah, because I mean, I could still hear you, and I was trying to, I was trying to, like, hey, Rachel, Rachel. Um, but then I just hung up and called back in. Good, good, good. I'm glad you did that. Excellent. Um, so moving forward, what do you think you're going to focus on? You said there could be other actions that you you're thinking about getting involved with. 
and that's where we got kind of died. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm not sure what kind of form it will take, but there'll definitely be, you know, some kind of, you know, other peaceable assembly, other kind of rally. Um, you know, we might take some digital. I'm not, I'm not really sure, um, you know, what the future holds. Um, as much as I can say is that we're definitely not going to, um, stop at this point. I mean, we knew what we were walking into and we're not going to back down from it because, you know, we, we just earnestly believe, you know, we're dealing with fundamental rights here when it comes to the First Amendment, you know, freedom of speech, peaceful assembly. Um, mm-hmm. So there's definitely more coming. I'm just not sure what form exactly that will take as of yet. How could people support you, Garrett, if they think they want to get behind what you're doing? Is Do you have a website or do you have a, a group or a Facebook page or something that people could, you know, reach out to you and join up with you if you want them to? Absolutely. We have a uh, a Facebook page right now that is our, our principal vehicle for organizing and um you know, putting together our rallies. It's Boston Free Speech is the name of the Facebook um, um, group page. Um, we also have a Twitter up for the same um, for Boston Free Speech, but the, the handle now is a little bit funky. It's, it's NFS. It's a new free speech movement, NFSM. Um, so I believe like one of the original Twitter handles got messed up. But if you go to our Facebook page and just look up <laughs> Boston Free Speech, it's the yeah. best way to um, to connect with our group and see what's going on. Okay, so Boston Free Speech is the best way to hook up. And your name is Garrett Kirkland. And they should see a picture of you or something at that to know that they're at the right place. But with the, yeah, what, so what on, the Boston Free, on the Boston Free Speech page, we have a, a little symbol that represents the Parkland bandstand. It's the circle with the seven lines coming out of it, um, with like seven spokes of a wheel. That's actually a graphic representation of the Parkland bandstand in the middle and the seven um, paths that come from the bandstand to the outer circle around it. Uh, so just look for the circle with the seven spokes on your Boston Free Speech, and that's us. Okay, okay. I like how you guys have the logo already. That's pretty cool. Um, now, wh- can I just ask, what do you do in real life when you're not an activist? Yeah, typically I do, and I don't really want to give away. Uh, so again, no, I, 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 I don't are... want people to come to your place and start bobbing and stuff, but like, what's your – your livelihood you don't have to say where you work or anything but are you an artist are you a a a lawyer what are you no i I am i'm i do customer service for um e-commerce kind of companies um okay you know pretty pretty not very sophisticated thing um you know i just i just do a lot of talking for a living so yeah and what was the the thing that like kicked you off to become an activist you said like you're 33 years old now, but and the Fed was a while ago. What was that almost 10 years ago? So you were in your 20s when you started, yeah, right? Yeah, um, like 2007 or so um, was the end the Fed movement. Um, maybe as early as 2006, but definitely by 2007. Um, I mean, the thing that really got me, you know, motivated to get involved was, um, you know, Ron. It was really Ron Paul. The 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 cliche or the, the adage that goes, you know, Ron Paul cured my apathy, um, you know, came out and, and yep. showed that, you know, you can be a non-interventionist, you can stand up against, you know, the, the entrenched establishment, um, you know, and, and be involved in politics. So he kind of got me in the door. And then from there, I, you know, kind of went down the anti-war road, you know, the anti, you know, Federal Reserve road. And then it was Occupy Boston, which, you know, I saw as a direct relation to, you know, we have the Federal Reserve, which is the same banks that are Wall Street. So I, I you know, kind of parlayed that over to Occupy Boston and, and it really all started with, you know, with Ron Paul and the Fed and, and non-interventionists, like anti-war stuff. Right, right. Now, I don't know if you know about me. I used to work for a defense contractor. I worked for a defense contractor. Uh-oh. I was in the marketing department of a defense contractor. And Oof. it was the Ron Paul thing that kind of blew my mind. And I, when I ended up quitting my job and I spent a good decade traveling around trying to promote Ron Paul. And I was the person in charge of the um, marketing communications for the uh, first, the money bombs. Remember the money bombs? Cause they didn't know how to get that oh, yeah. stuff onto the, onto the mainstream news. And because I was in, from a defense contractor, I had this long list of people that I could contact. I got some stuff going on the, the news and I was like, wait a second, why aren't they covering this? Like what's really happening? You know, they, they didn't touch it until he was making a certain amount of money. They made that money that, you know, just a ton of money. And it was a story. It hit the story because money was involved. Yay. But then they kind of blew that over, glossed it over like, oh, well, this, you know, this other candidate got this many 
like donations promised to them. And they start saying some different things that to make it seem like it wasn't such a big deal. And then I, the next time I tried to contact all these same media outlets, nobody would talk to me. I was like, oh, my gosh, I really pissed some people off. And that's when I realized, wow, there's something to this. So um, and then that sent me down my Ron Paul rabbit hole. And I've since written some books about that experience, too. My books are called Security Through Absurdity. And I got them into the Rhode Island and Connecticut public high schools. And they're in the best uh, Goodreads Best New Series um, one that one year. And uh, there's some movies coming out based on the books, too. And they're all all real life situations based on working at the defense contractor and working working with the Ron Paul stuff. So I, I hope you, I'm going to send you some of the copies if you'd like. Anyhow, it looks like somebody's calling in right now. I want to, I want to unmute that person and have them speak. Okay, hold on, Garrett. Okay. Cool. Let's see who's here. Let's see who's here. Hello, caller. You're on the air with us. What's up? Hi, this is Sam from uh, Rhode Island. Right How's on, Sam. Did you go to the uh, rally? I did go to the rally. I was in the uh, kind of battle zone up there. It was... um. Kind of very intense, very intense and overwhelming. Really? All right. Tell us from your point of yeah. view. You you came from Rhode Island. Did you take a bus? Did you drive? Where did you park? I I well I live. I, maybe I shouldn't give exactly where I live. Yeah, just, I live within walking distance of, of the train. Yeah. I took the commuter rail. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So uh, yeah. yeah yeah I live I live in Rhode Island. I took the commuter rail from uh, Attleboro up to Boston. Um, mm -hmm. You know, starting out the day, there were a lot of people there at the commuter rail, probably about 20, 30 people we didn't get on the train at that one stop. Um train was full when we got, got in. Um, you know, um, I don't know. I got I got up to Boston, walked. I There were people getting off the way, like in Ruggles right. and, and other towns, to uh, join the big giant march down that got there a little bit later in the afternoon. Um that big surge that you saw walking in towards the bandstand after 12. Um, so I, I just went straight to um, the park. I got there probably about 1130 or so. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there, there was a good amount of people there, but it was still kind of small. You know, I didn't, I have, I don't watch TV. I wasn't really sure what I was getting myself into. Um, I was familiar <laughs> now, with, when you say when you say there was a good amount of people there, you're talking about the protesters, the counter protesters, or the rally people. Well, well, one, I, 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 there's the rally people, and then there were were the protesters. That you know, like what any count, counter protesters, they they were all protesters. They were all there to protest that rally. Um, okay. There, there was there was um, you know, a few hundred people at that point. It was maybe a little bit before eleven thirty. Okay. Um, so anyways, like, you know, I'm walking around the park trying to figure things out. I went up there by myself. Um, I knew about the rally that they had held back in, in May, the, the, uh, the first one. So I was expecting kind of a, a few hundred people from each side, you know, I was expecting right. some Antifa. I was expecting conservatives, um, kind of the, 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 the tech, the Keck mean people to be yeah, there. Yeah, that's kind that of, kind of, thing. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> yeah, right on. Go ahead. Yeah, that's that's like a big 4chan troll thing, and and you know, like to to these guys, it's 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 kind of like a joke, and uh, you know, but but Antifa takes it very seriously. A lot of people, from what they learn in the news, and and you gotta be so careful with what the news is telling you because. Uh, as we saw this day, it, it's a lot of propaganda and, and falsities. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I, I was expecting more of a, a situation kind of like that, you know, much right. more tame. I, did, I didn't expect it to be 40,000 people <laughs> marching into the park. Um, so, yeah, um, some of the first things I, I saw when I got there is, like, more love arguing from the protesters, you know, protesters arguing against other protesters. There was one kid dressed up as a furry. So, like, you know, he had, like, this big wolf outfit on, you know. Um, and God bless him if he stayed the whole day because it was really hot. We were wearing all that fur. But uh, he had a sign saying, on the one side of the sign, it said, this this party sucks. Um, on the on the other side of the sign, it, it it's like, you know, if, 
relate, relating something to like, you know, if they stomp out my free speech, whatever, uh, you know, who's going to be next? Um, this girl from Black Lives Matter comes marching up to him thinking that he's there to mock, mock the people protesting. So like, you know, she, she's getting a big fight and they had to kind of separate them. And he's like, no, look, I'm underneath the spur. I'm a minority too. I'm here to support your call. So I'm not here to be mocking. <laughs> Um, All right, so, so, so you know, communication and, issues here. His sign wasn't resonating with the right audience, apparently. It, okay, it wasn't, and and and, and you know, it, it it was silly. There are few, there were a few other things like that. You know, I, I mean, like um, you you saw a few people dressed up with like uh, um, patriotic type clothes, and those people were definitely targeted uh, by people within the crowd. A lot of yelling. You know, I saw people being chased down within that mob. And like, if you know, you're, I, if you're wearing, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're wearing patriotic type clothes to the free speech. Yeah, pro- like, you know, like some, 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 if you were there and, and mind you, only, only the police only let certain people within that, that, that rally group, the original rally group to actually be up on the podium or, or to get in a, a safe zone, you know. Did, did you get I in? Were you able to get in? I No, no, I, no. I was, I was on the protesting side the whole time. Um, so, so, you know, but you I, I was, wanted, just but you of, wanted to be in, you wanted to go up into the pavilion, right? Yeah. Yeah. I went there originally to take photographs. You know, I was, I dressed very neutrally because I wanted to stay neutral. Didn't really want to show what, what kind of ideology side I, I take, you know, um, I just well, wanted well, to get good photos. So kind you were of, there just to of, like kind of get of, photos. You didn't care if you were on the outside or the inside. That, that was my intention. Yeah, I, I kind okay. of wanted to get photos of both sides and then, okay. and then maybe also do some recording. Um, but uh, the, the whole thing was chaos the whole time. You know, police weren't letting people in. It was like just this no man's land. So you couldn't hear anything that was going on. From what I saw from, from the protest side, it was just everybody there was just had those guys are, are the Nazi hate speech guys. We don't care what they have to say. We don't want to give them a chance to speak. And they didn't even know who was up there speaking. Now, on my train trip up there, I was kind of looking into this more because I, I knew I knew one guy that actually was one of the organizers. He actually didn't he actually ended up marching with the protesters that day, um, for various reasons. Um Wait, one of the organizers the of the free speech rally, he couldn't get into the actual, his own rally? No, he, 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 no because, because of, of the way the, the day went, he actually, um, are, are the things leading up to the event. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm going, I'm basically reached out as an olive branch to go marching with the protesters, you know. Um, there, there, there's some other stuff. I'll give you the guy's name after. Um, yeah, okay. But I don't, I don't there. understand what um, that was like. An, what do you mean an olive branch? What is, what was it going to do? What is it, that? There's 40,000 people trying, there. What, I don't get it. I, well, I, you know what? Whether, whether he had made plans to do this or not, um, to, to, to reach the thousands of people, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if anybody expected 40,000 people to be actually <laughs> coming not. up that day. Yeah, you I know? don't think anybody did. Um, Maybe they did. You know, kind of. Who knows? Yeah. Okay. Well, so overall, what Derek, was your, do, you, do you know who I'm talking you, about? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think so, but I don't want to name him. Yeah. Yeah. So he he's made a couple public announcements. So after the show, I'll give you his name if you want to contact him. Oh, okay. All right. He might be a good um, so guest for your, a future episode. <laughs> Sam, Sam, <laughs> Sam from Rhode Island. Um, what was your feeling when you left there? Would how did you feel? I felt I felt like um. Oh, geez. How, how would I explain it? Um, it really kind of took me a couple of days to wrap my mind about around what was going on. But I, I've known Garrett from the end of Red uh, and the Fed rallies. You know, I don't know him too well, but I did know him. Um, you know, I've had I've had him on my Facebook since probably the, the first time I met him in 2008. You know, and mm-hmm. I know that he's been partic- participating in all these activist things up in Boston. Um like I said, I knew that other guy. I know him to be a, a, a fairly decent person. Um, you know, not racist or anything like that, you know. Um, yeah. 
so so I'm like, and, and and then there's Ann Armstrong and Alan from the Healing Church in Rhode Island. They okay. were up there. I'm like, oh geez, they're up there, and you know, they're 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 activists too, and they go to a lot of different things. Um, and as I started to look at the more people up there on on that that were on the list, um, you know, it, it became apparent that 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 the the media was just slandering this group. Um, and I, I, there's no other way of putting it, you know, I mean, like what they did was just so disingenuous, um, blatant lies about trying to connect this to the other events that have happened the week before. And, um, and the mayor's speech, I mean, like the, the whole thing was crazy. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, you go up there and, and, a lot of those people, I I, th- I think that a lot of that crowd that came out to protest, I think that their intentions and their minds were right, but but um, they were misinformed. They yeah, really misinformed because I know I, when I used to live in Boston, if there was something like this going on, I'd be like, yeah, what the heck? I get get myself together and head mm-hmm. into the streets. Why not? Seems like a pretty decent thing. We hate people that hate people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you're right. Um, but. I think the whole thing, there's like this total miscommunication about what was going on. And I think that was on purpose to get this whole media hype stuff going because, of course, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. And the media loves that. They could get stuff like that on TV. I think they were waiting for something horrible to happen. With with those numbers, it's... If something bad does happen, it can happen in the flash, you know? Yeah. The, yeah. uh, what, once these groups see see that there, there's something going on, you know, the police are going to act, uh, react quick. Once they react, more protesters go, are going to come out and say, hey, they're they're being abusive right now. They're they're using their big tools and toys, you know. So, yeah, yeah, it was um, definitely a powder keg waiting to go off. Um, fortunately, most of that fuse was stomped out, so nothing bad really significantly happened that day, but. It was still a scary, it was scary the whole time. Yeah, I bet. I can I only bet. imagine how now, scary it was for the people up on that bandstand. That's why well, I want to ask Garrett, okay, um, Sam from Rhode Island. Um, Garrett, you still here? Yeah. Okay. I am. I did hope. you guys? Yeah. Did you guys do anything in preparation of? Did anybody have any weapons or pepper spray or anything like that on them? Thinking, because you did say you kind of got the hint that something after Charlottesville was making your rally kind of a target for these people to come and, you know, think that you were a hate group. Did you, were you doing anything to protect yourselves? Well, we, you know, we literally put ourselves completely at the mercy of the Boston Police Department um, and put our faith in them to, you know, to be the professional organization that they are and do their job and, and you know, keep, you know, us and, you know, the people that wanted to basically wring our necks um, separated. We, as an organization, you know, it, it, we can't control every individual. As an organization, we specifically told, you know, all of our, our people, you know, no weapons of any sort, you know, leave the shields at home. Because you, you know how, um, you know, people like to lark around with the, with the shields these days, you know, in response to the Antifa violence that's been going on. So we were like, you know, leave all that stuff at home. We really want to put out our best face and show that, you know, this is a 100% genuine, peaceable assembly. We're not coming looking for a fight. We're not coming ready for a fight. You know, we're coming to exercise our First Amendment rights. Um, so we, you know, as we made a couple different statements from our, our page saying, hey, you know, it's like, don't come looking for a fight. Don't, because we denounce political violence. So we're like, you know, don't come for a fight. Don't bring any weapons of any sort. Um, so, you know, I believe that pretty much everybody adhered to that. Um, you know, it, it's, again, it's hard to control every single individual, but as an organization and a coalition, you know, we're like, you know, leave all that stuff at home. It's, it, not like it would, in in reality, it wouldn't have even mattered anyways because we knew the approximate size of what the crowd was going to be against us. Maybe we didn't realize it was going to be like forty five thousand people, but we knew that there was going to be a huge mob against us anyway. So it was like you know, be ready to travel light. So that's, you know, we we left the the PAs behind. We didn't even try to get a PA because we're like you know, if we have to move quickly, we need to just everything you can pick up with your hand and run. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So you guys were there, like, totally without any sort of protection other than the police for you guys to block all these people off of you. Um, Did you feel, I asked you this before, but at what point did you feel like, or at any point, did you feel like you should have maybe brought some protection? 
You know, it, it really wouldn't have even mattered. Um, <laughs> the, a mob that size, there was there was only like a, a few dozen of us that were actually on the gazebo. Um, a lot of our supporters were, were actually stuck out into the mob themselves, and they were getting beaten up and brutalized and, and intimidated by the crowd. Um, it wouldn't have made a difference what we had brought if we right. had brought anything anyways. Yeah, tell me about the people that were getting beaten up. Yeah, so I mean, I, I watched on the foot, on the replay on the footage, I, I watched a number of people on both sides, like, like pro, you know, pro free speech, pro Trump people, um, and, you know, the anti free speech people and the anti Trump people. And again, we're not, we're not specifically a, you know, pro Trump organization at all. We believe that the Trump people shouldn't be beaten up for, you know, supporting Donald Trump. Like, it's not fair. This is, this is our political system where people have a right to their opinion. Um, but I mean, we watch, I mean, I watched video of this guy. He was, he was in the crowd and he had, he had no hair. He was, he was bald. He was t- a big bald guy with, with piercings and stuff. And I watched him talking to, to some, a uh, couple of people and, and they're having a heated exchange. And it seemed like it was a misunderstanding because he was definitely on the, 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 the counter protester side. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, while he's having this exchange, I see this guy come from his side, right from, from his, fl- from his right flank and his blind spot. And just smashed the guy in the face with his fist and just knocked him out. Like, he went straight down. So like, this guy was like, and again, he was he was on their side. And so like, this guy's like, as people are helping him get back up and stuff. And he's like, they're asking him like, oh, you know, well, how do you how do you feel with that? Are you still gonna hang around? Blah, blah blah. And the guy's just like, you could see the look on his face, like how he was just attacked by his own people. And he's just like, man, I don't even know. Well, you know yeah. what was going on anymore? If he's gonna stick around, and I, I saw. There was there was a couple of our guys that were trying to get in. There was there was these two kids, and I, I saw a tweet from I guess the kid's mother. Um, one was a, a, a young Hispanic guy, and one was a, a young Russian Jewish guy. And they had on the young Russian Jewish guy had on the Israeli flag as a kid. We couldn't bring any poles, so he had on the Israeli flag, and the the young Hispanic kid had on a I don't know I hope that's the PC term for it whatever. Um, he had on a Trump flag as, you know, as a cape himself. And they came together and I was, I was watching the crowd like would circle around them, screaming at them. Just, it was brutal. Like the stuff that our, our supporters had went through just being stuck out in that crowd. And again, the, the, the police under orders from above wouldn't let anybody into, you know, the support into, into our area. They wouldn't let anybody through to actually come and attend the rallies. Like they were all stuck out there in, in the mob. It was insanity. Um, it was, it was, it was a very angry and vitriolic experience out there from what I saw. And, yeah. Um, how many, do you know how many people were supposed to be at your rally? Did you have any sort of indication that, oh yeah, we'll have like a hundred people? Like you said, you were thinking maybe a hundred, two hundred people. And how many people were actually at, at your rally at the, at the pavilion? So we were expecting that there was going to be, um, you know, anywhere from two to three hundred or more supporters for us um, that wanted to come out for the free speech event, kind of similar to what the attendance was last time that we had, um, you know, back in May when we had the same kind of thing, um, obviously under different circumstances. Um, so we were expecting like two to three hundred people or more that would be coming out to support, you know, our pro First Amendment message. Um, and you know, I had, you know, the cops would let anybody through the gates at all. I mean, I had. I, I ventured out to the gate trying to find one of our, our speakers, and they wouldn't even let some of our speakers through. And it, I had people like pro-Trump people screaming at me because I couldn't get the cops to let them through the gate. And they're like, they're mad at me, like I betrayed them, like I just left them out there with the wolves and the jackals. And I'm just like, wow, man, this is this is totally surreal. Um, you know what is going on to our people? And we were under the understanding that there was going to be concentric circles, that there would be an inner circle around the gazebo for you know, up to a hundred people and then that there would be an area around for observers and, and for supporters to come in and be able to actually hear the speeches from the the park and bandstand. But come to find out that actually ended up just being a no man's land and just a big only patrolled by cops and nobody was allowed in at all. Uh, but we were supposed uh, to have like two, three, maybe more um hundred people there. Wow. Okay. So mm-hmm. in your estimation there's a hundred people lost in the crowd out there, possibly getting smushed. I'm um, gonna we'll go back to Sam. Sam Yes. Are you still here? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, yes. So you yes. said you got, all this was going on. You're outside, and I I read. I, I think I know who you are, and I read something on a Facebook thing where you said this girl ran up and breathlessly said, "Oh, the cops shut it down." Tell us about that. Do you know okay. what I'm talking? Okay. Well, well. Yeah. I I do. Yes, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. That was after Garrett. Every after every. That was probably about half an hour after they closed the bandstand down, after they 
hustled everybody out. Um, yeah. You know, I was walking around the park. I go sit down on the bench, right? And uh, I'm sitting there next to a few other people, and then this girl comes running up, all excited. She's like, you know, but just in case you guys haven't heard, they, they shut the rally down. We won. We, we won. We ended the free speech. And that just really <laughs> rung a bell in my head. Uh, it's like, what? Do you know what you're saying? I mean, like, free free speech is your most fundamental right. You don't know the people that were up on the bandstand even, and and uh, they're trying to help protect the rights the rights that this country affords you. You know, one one, one of the, the probably the most valuable right. You know, that's why they put it as the uh, the First Amendment. Um, right. But I I mean, it, to me, at that moment, it just kind of really. <laughs> rung a bell that, that all all of those 40,000 people that were there, they were all basically hoodwinked, you know, hoodwinked yeah. into coming out to, to fight against their own fundamental rights as a human being. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, it was sad, wow. you know, and, and throughout the day, I mean, like, that's all it was. It was like just people, it was 40,000 people, a mob. There's no There's no talking to anybody that day. Um, not not in that situation, you know. If you bring up that kind of conversation, you're, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for, you know, even if you're engaging in a good positive conversation with one person, you're surrounded by so many other people. Somebody else would come up and butt into the conversation, start shouting out Nazi, and you know, so it it was that kind of atmosphere. Uh-huh, and then once uh-huh. one person shouts out Nazi, that you got a conglomerate forming around you trying to chase you out um, now no. yeah so it, i just heard there's in the united states there's only something like i don't i don't even know what the number is i want to say 600 or 6,000 registered um it was some some number was six um registered members of the kkk and mm-hmm. if that's that small of a number why are People, granted, it's you know it's obviously a hate group, the, the Ku Klux Klan, obviously a hate group, an organized hate group. Um, why do you think the media is getting everybody whipped up about the KKK when we have wars we're dealing with? We've got what are we in? Garrett would know this. Yeah. How many uh, how many countries are we in right now? Seven. I know oh, we have bases. Seven at like least. How many? Yeah. Seven at least. I mean, we're we're in Yemen, Syria, Afghanistan, I and mean, we're still in Iraq. Um, you know, and a couple others I can't really throw off the top of my head. Yeah. So how how come these people aren't getting all up in everybody's face about being in another country and being at war? How why is that? Why do you think there's a disconnect between protesting a war or protesting instead your rally? Oh, I've. I, it's 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 easier to follow what's being fed to you than it is to critically think and actually you know take responsibility for your own actions. Um, I really believe that a lot of the people that came out had the best intentions in heart. That you know they believe what so they were too. told. I think so too. I think so too, Garrett. Yeah, keep going. I'm, I'm listening. I'm, I was just agreeing with you. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Keep going. Yeah, no, fine. That's, that's fine. Um, and so I mean, what has what really drove me away from the quote unquote left, and and I am. I consider myself a left. I hold a lot of socialist views, you know, single payer and, 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 you know, environmentalist and this, that, and the other thing. Um, What really drove me away from that side of the spectrum in this past year has been exactly that. It's like we can mobilize all these people to march against, you know, march for the, march for, uh, you know, climate change, uh, Paris Accords, climate change accords, to to march for the women's march led by Linda Sarsour and, and some dubious characters. But nobody will come out and march for, you know, against the wars. Nobody will come out and say, hey, you know, hands off of Syria. Like, I, 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 I couldn't get 100 people to come out to a hands off Syria rally, but you can get 45,000 people to say, hey, we don't want free speech. Like, there's something going, there's something wrong right now. Yeah. Do you think there's anything, um, I've heard of people talk about entrainment, um, and that's basically, entrainment is a type of brainwashing that they do with television. And there's a couple different, um, places there's they changed their name but one of the companies neurofocus is what they used to be called uh nielsen nielsen ratings bought them um they hook up little monitors they started hooking up monitors to little children's heads while they were watching tv so they could see what parts of the brain 
were lighting up when people watch TV. And um, their biggest clients were the news agencies early on because they wanted to see what was getting people excited and keeping them watching. And what it turned out was is that it's almost like your brain has a, um, a gas pedal and a brake. And the television, the news stations especially, with their swir- swirling logos and swishy, if you notice on the news, it's very, it moves a lot. Everything's moving all the time, bright, bright colors. Um, you have two areas in your brain. One is like a gas pedal and one's like a brake. And an effective news channel will keep you going break, gas, break, gas, break, gas all the time. And you'll feel, you're, you'll be almost hypnotized. Basically, you're hypnotized and very susceptible to anything that they're feeding you. So I've heard a lot of people talking about entrainment by the television um, recently, especially there was a lot of it going on during the election. And I feel like a lot of that is still with people. And they, that's why they take things very personally. And um, that's what I, I think. It's just my, my just little old me talking about it. I think that a lot of people that showed up to, to be against your rally they were still latched on to that part of the psychology that had been touched in them because of the entrainment. That's my, that's just my theory um, because I've heard a lot of people talking about entrainment lately. That's interesting. Yeah. And then you put that, you put that together with stuff like, like the uh, Tavistock Institute. They're known for um, kind of gang community organizers and groups. They did a lot of um, activity with the Occupy groups, at least over in Europe. I know that. Um, where they would have basically leaders of the, the small groups within the Occupy to kind of drive the conversation for the groups, you know. Um, and that's where a lot of that repetition stuff, like doing the human microphone, um, that just helps implant those ideas into people's heads as they're repeating back what the speaker is saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that actually going on right now. The other thing that's interesting to me is something called a fourth generation war. Um, that was something that was mm-hmm. brought up in like the late 80s. And that has to do, originally it had to do with overseas in areas that our, our army was marching around or our, our spook <laughs> were dealing with. But the fourth generation war, if anybody wants to go and look that up on Wikipedia, it will point out that one of the major tenets of a fourth generation war is to blur the lines between who the civilians are, who the combatants are, and literally to create fake news so that everybody's just so messed up about what's real that they're very susceptible to be being taken over. And that's a real thing. And my question is, who is doing this sort of attack on the United States right now? Who is that? And that's where I'm thinking. I don't know. That's that's a darn good question. (laughs) Yeah. I wouldn't even know where um, to touch that one from. I know. I know. I I would recommend everybody just, it's on Wikipedia. Look up fourth generation warfare. You'll see it. Um, Mostly they'll be talking about this as if it's a something out in, you know, some very poor country that our, our army is going to roll through. But, um, I, I'm getting the vibe that this may be going on here. Yeah, yeah. I could, I could certainly see that. I mean, like it. Again, the question is, who is it? You know, I. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know, and then that's when it gets well, out. Right? That that cheesy answer where, well, it's 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 the big giant corporations, but you know, that's there's not really the evidence to. Yeah, that. and that's where it gets all conspiracy and crazy, right? <laughs> and then, yeah, oh, that, that's what makes good radio, right? <laughs> that's but that's when you start to sound like the, the uh, crazy conspiracy theorist. It's like you, just, yeah. you can't back up your claims, but hey, GMOs, right? <laughs> right. No, it's true. that There's uh, different corporate interests that have a lot of money at stake. Um, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Shiva touched on that just brilliantly. And when he was speaking with us, very, very very proud of what he's doing, and I am going to donate to his campaign, even if he does say he it doesn't matter if he wins or not. He wants to raise awareness, and I think that's what Dr. Ron Paul was doing, too. Um, yeah. So. That might be the best we can even do at this point is to, you know, when you run your campaign is just to, to raise awareness and get it out there. Cause, I mean, I don't think anybody really has an, an illusion left that, you know, our comp- 
political system is completely bought and paid for. Like we don't we don't really have a voice anymore. Um, but it's like, what do you do? Do you give up, or do you keep you know trying to at least get your message out there and try to like put chinks in the armor? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Sam, are you a voter? Yes. Yeah, good. I okay. haven't voted since 2008. You have not. I have not voted you? since 2008. Okay. So Ron Paul, that that yeah. whole thing blew you out. That that blew me out a lot, you know. Um, yeah, I've been kind of the last couple of years. I've just been totally disinterested. Um, yeah, in, it's almost like you it. can't even you can't even yeah. watch it because you're just like, what the heck, man? What's the point? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I but, think it's um, great that you know, Dr. Shiva's trying to get I've people to like. Go ahead. Philosophical changes. I've had a few philosophical changes over the years, but um, overall, I mean, like, I think if you're in a small town, like, like you know, I got a buddy that lives up in Grafton, New Hampshire, where where you know, voting you can at least affect the local government. Mm-hmm. Where I live in Rhode Island, it, it, even here it's so populated. I feel like it's just um, there, there's not really much that you can do. If there's a movement going, you know, I will still stand behind certain politicians that have a good message. Um, you know, like Dr. Shiva, I'd, I'd be proud to help that man out. Yeah. You know, he got the message and he's going for it. He's, he's at least trying to raise awareness as Dr. Paul did. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, I think we've got maybe, I don't know, eight, nine minutes left or so, eight minutes. Um, now, Garrett, is there anything kind of in yeah. closing that you want to say, like a, to say about some websites that you want people to check out or things you want people to know or focus on? I mean, I would, I would really like to just, you know, underscore kind of what happened where, you know, the media and our establishment politicians, you know, the mayor and the governor and even the attorney general, um, you know, pushed a certain narrative and they drove people a certain direction, you know, through a total, like, it just seemed like the people just turned off their brains and just listened to what they were being said. And it's, it seems to have been a pattern over the past, you know, at least since Trump got elected that, you know, people just don't think anymore. They just, wherever the movement goes or perceived movement goes, they want to be there. And it's, I would really like people to look back on what happened and, and find the footage of our speeches and, you know, who came and actually look at what happened on the gazebo, who was present, what we said, compared to what they were told was going to happen and what they were told was going to be said. I mean, realize that how they've been duped. Like, I would really like to be the prime example of, you know, show people, like, we are all being lied to on a massive scale. We're all being socially engineered and manipulated against our own interests. Um, and I, I really just think that that should be the big takeaway from this. Um, we do consider this to be, you know, in the totality, we consider this to be a total victory for, you know, our cause because a lot of people have come from the counter side and come across now and saying like, hey, wow, like I was part of the march against you. I was part of the protest against you. And now looking back, I realize that, holy crap, I was just taken for a huge ride. I don't think people should feel ashamed that they got manipulated. I think that they should just take this as a learning experience and, and start to, you know, like I said at the top of the, of the show, start talking to each other. Start listening to people that you don't agree with. You don't have to agree with anybody. Just, just listen to them. Let's, let's reopen that dialogue. Let's stop mobilizing, you know, force against each other. That's what I really like to kind of underscore and have people take away from all of this. Okay, excellent. Sam? Our call-in guest yep. from Rhode Island, is you have anything specific if you want to say in a minute or two, something you could tell people that well, yeah, from your experience? I, I mean, I, I 100% agree with Gary. There's, there's, there's no reason for, for violence towards anyone. You know, I think, you know, and just, just like the right might have violent groups like the KKK, even though there's only 6,000 registered members, um, you know, there's, there's people like the, the, the guys that participate in Antifa. And they're just as violent and they're, they're close minded, you know. Um, and I think it's, it's to some degree, it is to control the narrative. You know, they don't want people hearing true dialogue. And, uh, you know, uh, the only way to make things better, better going forward, ooh, there's bells, um, yeah. is to, um, avoid the violence. You know, yeah. and, and yeah, listen. Yeah, avoid the violence. Thanks, Sam. Li- Thanks for calling in. 
And thank you so much, Garrett, for being on the show with us. I do appreciate it. And I want to thank Dr. Shiva for being with us, too. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This was a really important show. Thank you, everybody. See you next week on Shadow Citizen.